I have had the pleasure of working with you and seeing you in prime form. And to be to your credit, I've never seen you uh, falter. You know, I've, we've been in some wild situations, you know, yeah. sun coming in five o'clock in the evening. We're 40 feet from the nearest audience member. Uh, you've been in some wild situations, but I know you've got some stories that, uh, that I don't know about some, some just, some bad gigs dude everybody has bad gigs you know you try to avoid them at all costs like you know you know but yeah you're right i kind of like and only because i love what i do you might right. I, I don't i go into it looking for the best scenario i can i study the audience i look even if it's a bad situation um uh, i try to um give myself the best chance for success yeah but lots of times you don't you're not in control of certain things and it can get out. It, you know, they say the difference between the master of a craft and, 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 you know, somebody is that I failed more times than you even attempted, you know, right. and, and, and failure makes you better. I've learned more from bad sets than I ever have from good sets. They teach me things. Yeah. They take, I learn more. I walk away, you know, you're tossing and turning, you become a, a member of the Midnight Ass Kickers Club, what you could have done differently, what you could have said differently, tossing and turning all night. I mean, you write 20 lines in your head for those situations. Uh, yeah, we've done it. We've done a couple of corporates where weren't, we're not best set up. I mean, one that stands out as I was doing a corporate event for a Chinese bank, and these people saw my Comedy Central special, and so they were like, they picked me out of a lot of guys. You know, and so it's at the um, Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills. So it's uh, hoity-toity, right. right, to say the least. And, um, you know, and I'm walking around just listening to people. And usually you can listen to what people were talking about and say, you know what I mean? But these people were literally speaking Chinese. Ni ching lo fai ma in the lobby. And I'm going, holy smokes. Why nobody here speaks fucking English? And they're all walking into this room that I'm getting to perform in. And I'm going, all right, I only got to do 20 minutes. I only got to do 20 minutes. I only got to do 20 minutes. Let's uh, just stay, keep positive, keep focused. Well, what happens is they have this woman come out. My opening act is a woman in an evening gown. And she's going up there, and she's playing the one-string Korean fiddle. I mean, really, bro, it's something you'd see on PBS. You know what I mean? And this woman goes up there and fucking just brings the house down. I mean, there's not a dry ass in the place after she gets done, right? And then I was ready for some laughs. <laughs> and they brought me up, bro, and I fucked up. I couldn't, I, I almost fucking started running around tickling people just to get some fucking laughs. It was so fucking horrible. I mean, you know, like, you do these corporate things, like, like two Christmases ago, I swear to God, I was getting ready to do a show for this up in Santa Rosa, California, it was this company that ran, they had like five or six auto body shops, very successful. And they were doing their Christmas party and they hired me for the Christmas party. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so I just told the guy, you know, that you go over, go over everything that you need that will give me with the guy for the best chance for success. You know what I mean? I need a microphone. I need a stage. I need some lighting. I need, you know, I need a good sound system. If they can't see me um, and they can't hear me, well, they're not going to laugh. Well, I'm supposed to do that Friday night. Monday, I get a phone call from the guy telling me the owner of the company died. Oh, my God. But we're still going to have the Christmas party because that's what he would have wanted. We've already paid for the room. Right? And so I'm like, okay, fine, what, whatever. And I said, well, just set me up now. I mean, I don't want to, you know. Bro, they do a 20-minute tribute to this guy with video uh, presentations. People in the audience are fucking hugging each other, fucking crying and fucking visibly shaking. And the guy literally goes up. He does five minutes. goes, who's ready for some comedy? Like, after, like, a 20-minute eulogy, this guy, who by all accounts was a terrific fucking human being. He was a great guy, helped a lot of people, was a pillar of this community. Had but a great he, family. He's not a good opener. Well, definitely not a good opener. Wow, bro. 
guy's name is Peter that's bringing me up. And I was so fucking mad that they're introducing me after this guy. And the family sitting right up front. I said, I was just talking to Peter. And we were just said the last thing that John said on his deathbed was, I hope the comedian at the Christmas party is funny. Yeah. That was the last thing he said. So, I mean, what the fuck else was I going to do? I had nowhere else to go. I had nowhere else to go. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I swear to God, I wanted to fucking say it so bad. I was to teach him a fucking lesson, but I hadn't gotten the check yet because otherwise I would have just went up. I'm sorry, but you don't don't fucking put me in a bad situation, you know? It's so funny because people have no idea like what goes into it when they book you sometimes. You know, they, oh, they think you. Oh, they think you're just fucking supposed to be soggy, the dunk tank clown. You're just gonna go up there. Everybody's gonna chuck fucking softballs at you trying to put you in the tub. I mean, they don't realize it's an art form. There's an art form. There's elements to it. That's why I love, like, look, I love doing comedy clubs because everybody knows they're there to see fucking comedy. It's, you came to see comedy, I'm a comedian. It makes that jump so much shorter. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, you know, corporate events, you always, uh, you, you know, they're always very tricky to do because, and don't get me wrong, I, I did a I did a Vegas gig where I was doing like 600 liquor reps for uh, Kettle One, mm -hmm. and I got a standing ovation, you know? Uh, some of the gigs are great, you know? The, 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 some of them are great, and people know they have comedy every year. They know there's going to be a comedian. Those gigs are great, you know? But, I, you know, but, you know, like I said, you know, you live in 2020. Google me. Look at my fucking stand-up comedy. See what it is I do, and then you got to make that decision whether I'm the right guy for your fucking party. I'm not offensive. I'm not going to go up there and talk about fist fucking Mother Teresa in the back of a 7-Eleven on a meat slicer. And I, hey, and I, I tell you another thing about fucking breast cancer that I find funny. I'm not going to do any of that. But my act is, has a little edge to it. I was, I'm not X. I'm not R even. I think I'm NC-17. Yeah. You know, because the, 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 the topics that I talk about are not disgusting. I have a little bit of an edge to me, but you know, what are you going to do? I was raised by a homicide detective and I have six brothers. I spent my childhood in bloodstained hand-me-downs. You fucking hire Jimmy Schubert, you get Jimmy Schubert. Don't be a fuck. You know what I mean? Look, do a little fucking research before you hire me. Don't hire me and then go, hey, could you not do this and do that and do this? Why the fuck you hire me? Why don't you hire the guy that doesn't do that and do that and do the other thing, you know? You're right. They, they look at it like, look, they don't realize it's art. It is art, you know, and it's a, and it's and, and and to do it at a high level, you need to be at, like you know, you need to be put in the right situation. I mean, believe me, dude, I've bombed in front of, I've been heckled by ten thousand people, booed by ten thousand people, bro. There ain't nothing you can fucking do to me after you've been booed by ten thousand people in your own fucking town in front of your entire family. Where was There's nothing you could do to me on stage. You know, what? it's like, I was like in Kung Fu, where the guy lifted the kettle and moved it with his forearms to get his tattoos. You may leave the temple now. There is nothing you could fucking do to me. I mean, you know, my favorite thing, you know, and a lot of, like, you, and there's a lot of different types of gigs that are shitty. You know, my own mom, I was in Philadelphia at Helium. As I was just, this is such a Philadelphia story. My mom went to a function with my dad earlier. And my mom's a fucking two drink stretcher case. I swear to God, the bar, the bartender drops a bar rag near her. She gets fucking louder. She's very animated. She's Irish. And uh, she starts fucking heckling me at a comedy show. And the manager of the club, I see him off in the corner. He's pacing because he knows it's my mom. He goes, I can't. What am I going to throw the guy's mom out in the middle of his show? In Philadelphia? Rich Miller. Dennis Miller's brother was Helium Comedy Club. And dude, I mean, they fuck it. They, uh, I mean, she was just heckling me. And I was just like, Mom, why don't you tell them about the time I pissed myself in the third grade? Why don't you tell them that story? Like, we love you, Jim. I go, great. Where's dad at? He goes, I'm back here. He's like, I got any pops. Could you, you know, curb your bitch a little bit? All right, I'm in the middle of a show. I told him, well, <laughs> well, listen, you, I, bro, I, don't, I give nobody quarter. If you heckle me to show, I, I'm not going to give you any quarter because if I let you get away with it, even though you're my mom, everybody else is going to want to do it. Right. Don't get me wrong. People thought it was hilarious that I was being heckled by my mom, so I played it out a little bit, but then it, it just kept going on and on. 
when you're on stage and your mom's heckling you, is there a moment where you don't even realize it's your mom? Where you're like, who's talking? Yeah, no, I knew it was my mom. I could see her. She was sitting with a, a group of my brother's friends, and they were laughing so fucking hard because my mom was just going at me. You yeah. know what I mean? And I gave her a little bit of quarter, but I was like, hey, come on. Okay, we get it. You love me. I'm your favorite. We know that, right? But, you know, let's fucking, you're here. I need you here. You're here, mom. I need you here. Okay? Without me, with me. Without me, with me, you know, one of those. <laughs> Why? How did you get heckled by all those people in your hometown or booth? Oh, we were doing the Opie and Anthony. Uh, the, it was called the Virus Store, believe it or not, and it was one of the most stellar lineups I've ever seen. I, I haven't really talked about this, but it was it was a spectacle. Yeah. And I, I, and this is how long ago it was. I was covering the event for MySpace, and so we went into the parking lot, and it's like. They're fucking tailgating for the fucking Eagles game. They're doing shots, Jaeger bombs. I mean, the show's at five. This is like two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, oh shit, this is gonna be crazy. And, and it seats like ten thousand people. At the last minute, they open up these uh, ten dollar tickets, about a thousand of them, for the back lawn. Oh my god! And it's all those fucking people, right? <laughs> and you know, there's there's, there's there's a whole little museum thing where guys are taking maraschino cherries and trying to lob them into a woman's leather Cheerio. She's got her thong bottom off. There's like, you got to try to hold down all five balls on the water. What, what was that woman who drowned her five kids oh. in, 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 in Texas? Like it was, it was like the challenge where you had to hold five balls. I mean, this is the type of people you're fucking dealing with. This is the opening and ant the audience. It's like, hey, everybody still lives with their mom and dad over here. Everybody with no muscle tone over here. You know, it's everybody lives in their parents' basement here. Everybody, that, that, I mean, it, it was just a, a, even Opie and Anthony, I think, were afraid of their fans at that point. They were just fucking crazy. But so Rich Voss is supposed to go on. I think Rich Voss is supposed to do about 10 minutes. He does about four. And he'd be doing these shows because they always fucking booed Rich. And so he does four minutes, gets in, gets out, and then just fucking brings me right up. There's no way he did the 10 minutes he was allotted. Oh, my God. And then throws me to the wolves. Now, I'm on about seven minutes before I go, and I don't know, like, I don't know if they're, they're booing me. I just thought they were loud, and so I'm cutting, and I'm getting to jokes. I'm editing on the fly. Boom, boom. And then about eight minutes in, I realize they're fucking booing. And in my back of my mind, I halfway wanted to go, Fuck you, people. Go, you know what I mean? But because that's my fucking instinct. Right. But I also am the first guy on a fucking three hour show, and you got one of the best comedy lineups going. Tracy Morgan went on after me, Bob Saget, Ralphie May, Robert Kelly, oh again, Bill Burr, Jimmy Norton, Dom Irera. I mean, it was a fucking cavalcade of who's who in fucking comedy. It was fucking, it was an amazing comedy lineup that they brought. I'm not kidding you. And it's a shame, but they then then they started booing everybody. It would be like it would like being at like Woodstock, you know what I mean? Right. Like and, and and you know like that audience doesn't want to see a great comedy show. They want to affect the comedy show. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. They want to be part of it and intertwined in it. And so that's what they did. But they they booed Don Myrera. They booed me. They started to boo Bob Saget until he broke out his guitar. They were going to start booing Tracy Morgan because he stuck up for me. And he was just like fucking, you know. And, you, you know, and, and, and Jimmy Norton came running up to me. God bless Jimmy Norton. She says, hey, shoot me. I had nothing to do with you, man. He goes, it's just a fan base. They're fucking crazy. I mean, he did extremely well. Bill Burr is the legendary set where he fucking went on that tangent. And people right. go to YouTube and look it up. That was the thing that fucking, I mean, Bill was already, but that put him into a stratosphere, like to a, to a, to a point where almost every open Anthony show after that, they wanted him to do that. So right. it's like kind of making a deal with the devil. And, you, you know, it's not about art. It's about surviving the 20 fucking minutes at that point. But, you know, that just fucking put Bill into a stratosphere and he had the money more. It was just like boom, 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 boom. I mean, so you think about a bad situation, you can make the best of a bad situation like that. Let me look what it, and, 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 and it was amazing. And I was watching with Dom from the side. Fuck, he's got, 
11 minutes left. And Bill goes, I got 11 minutes left. And I'm doing all of it. And I will be selling merch after the show. And the thing about his rant that I fucking loved was the sheer amount of information he had about the city of Philadelphia. Like it had been I, it had just pent up for years of maybe sports dramas where Philly beat fucking Boston. And it just all came out. And it was fantastic, man. You know, you got a legendary boxing hero named fucking Joe Frazier. What do you fucking do, you cheesesteak eating fucks? You put a fucking a fucking statue of Rocky, a fictional fucking character, you fuck. I mean, just your know, flyers, they, they ought to fucking take fire the flyers and put the ice capades in there. They ain't one of Stanley Cups. Look like they're skating mud. I mean, he just thought it was a barrage. I got seven minutes left, and I'm doing it all. It was fucking masterful. And, you know, he told me later, he said a couple weeks before that, he got booed at Beecher's Madhouse. Yeah. Where they like physically removed him from the stage. And he said, if I ever am in that situation again, that's what, that's how he was going to play it. And man, it, I, I thought it was fucking masterful. Right. You know what I mean? And, 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 and the consequence was he was a guy who leaned into it and went for the fucking thing. And it just put him into another stratosphere, you know? Yeah. And he's, I, he's one of my favorite comedians uh, you know, I don't watch a lot of comedy, but I watch a few guys, and he's a—he's just one of the funniest guys on the fucking planet. It's great to see, like he's just kind of fucking. He's like the, you know, there's—he's a monster, man. Yeah, it's one of those shows that uh, it could make or break you, and it made him, you know. But somebody else in that situation, that could be their last time. You know, they're in the car. They're like, I'm done. I'm done with this business. No, well, I know people that, uh, that like, a, a guy that I'm still friends with used to open for me and Sam, and he bombed, like, like horribly bombed. Couldn't fucking buy – and they literally found him. He was in the hallway in a paint closet fucking crying. I mean, it affects people, you know? I mean, you're a human being, for God's sakes, at the end of the day, you know? I mean, you know, it's like um, – I was talking to Augie Smith. who told me the story about a feature act he was working with that night. And he said the kid had a really rough time. Yeah. And he felt really bad for him. And so um, Augie was on his way back to his hotel room. And he said, I halfway thought about shooting. He goes, I halfway thought about knocking on the guy's door and just seeing if it was okay. What happened is the kid OD'd that night. Yeah. I guess he took an Oxycontin and snorted it and took the time release off it. And he OD'd and he died in a hotel room. And Augie said, I goes, I had to call his family and you know and, and do all that stuff and it wasn't pleasant i just thought i just thought i i wish i could get back in front of that fucking audience and tell them are you guys fucking happy now are you fucking happy now right. you know that that, that that you you know and, and and i get it you know you gotta you know you can't i guess you can't encourage bad talent if someone makes you laugh they make you laugh if they don't they don't but you can at least be considerate that it's another fucking human being on stage you don't have to but you know but that, you know we're we're obviously we're in the middle of this fucking pandemic now. And certainly, you, I, and it, man, it really, dude, I swear to you, I miss doing stand-up so much. Oh, yeah. And, I, 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 and, I, and I, you, you just take things for granted. Even the bad sets, even my bad sets are still better now than most people's good, you know, good sets because I, I, I've done this for a long time. I've yeah. done this for a long time, and, and I've gotten really good at it, and I still love to do it. So... Yeah, but uh, boy, the, the little things you take for granted, you know. Do you and the do handshakes? You the what's that? From the early days, you know. Do you, you know, when you're first starting out, everything is life and death. It feels like. Do you have any of those sets from the early days where you're like, like this could have that almost broke me. It didn't, and that's what no, broke no. Me. I never. I no, bro. Look, when I'm on stage, yes. When I walk off, I leave it up there. Yeah, I try to anyway. I mean, it's it. No, look, nobody bats 400 during the season. You know, maybe you get to 400, but then you back down to 328. You get up to 350, then you you know it's 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 nobody bats 500 during the season. And and the thing is, you can you can almost every bad set I have, I can I can say was because of something I did. I didn't connect. I didn't take time to make a connection and talk to them. Either you were talking down to them or you were talking at them, 
or you're being condescending or something and you just didn't connect. I think it's imperative that you connect. And if you don't do, and if you do that, chances are you'll have a good set, but it's like, you know, and sometimes there's a drunk heckler in the audience and it, you know, fucks up everybody's evening, right. you know? <clears throat> what do you, I think, what's that? Besides your mom, do you have any hecklers? You're like, man, like, obviously your mom's a, a special scenario, but do you have any hecklers or you're like... No, but, I, you know, I, let me finish that you. story. Let me finish yeah. that story. The, the next night, my, my mom came out. Okay. And I I was videotaping that show. So I literally was watching it in my parents' living room. And my mom was sitting on the couch watching her heckle me. Oh and she God. was so embarrassed. And my mom, my mom... Is a, is, a, is a stately woman. You know, she's raised five, six boys and six monsters. You know, they're, they're like me. And, and she's a selfless woman and she's loved us. And, 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 and she came in the night, she was so embarrassed. And Rich Miller said to me, goes, if I didn't meet your mom tonight and realize how out of character that was for her, because she seems like she's really embarrassed by it. And she seems like a very, you know, stately woman. Well, I said, yeah, well, that's. You know, of course she's embarrassed because she got to watch the tape with me. We both went over our sets. Yeah. <laughs> I know there's a video of you online of a fire alarm going off during your show. And you go out into the street. Now, it, what happened with that? Well, it's funny. It was a Saturday night. It was at Hilarities in Cleveland. Okay. It's so funny you bring up that story because that's the thing. Um. A lot of things I had to learn. The most important thing I learned in my life about when I was doing stand-up comedy was to become a consummate professional. Mm -hmm. I was always funny. I was always a goofball. <clears throat> Becoming a consummate professional. I'm literally on stage 12 minutes and the fucking alarm goes off. Eh, eh, eh. And I don't know if someone pulled it, if it's by accident. I got a showroom full of people here. What happened was upstairs, if you've been in Larry's, it's like... Yeah like two floors and someone was moving a stack of those fucking chairs on one of those wheelie things hit one of those ceiling sprinklers and popped it right out of the ceiling so now there's 44 gallons of water just rushing out of this fucking pipe per minute like 44 gallons of water per minute this club is a million dollar club it is a gorgeous fucking showroom with a high-end so restaurant upstairs. Yeah, absolutely. And so people are loading trash cans underneath the water. They got the squeegees going. You know, what automatically calls the fire department. It automatically sets off the alarm because they don't know. They, they, they This machine thinks it's a fire. And so everybody has to evacuate the building. It's a, kind of a Cleveland night. It's a little bit chilly, not too bad. Kind of a cool winter night. And... They were doing construction on the House of Blues across the streets. So there was a lot of gravel in the fucking streets that was covering the street. So you couldn't really find, if you were looking for the, the shutoff valve, you had to know where it was to find it. Yeah. And so all this is going on. There's an audience standing on this side of the street watching. There's dudes squeegeeing out the water right out the building. There's the fire department. And the owner goes, hey, Jimmy, would you mind? I go, no. Drop the microphone, put the speaker up, let's do it just for the story. I didn't realize there was a dude, Kevin Jackson was the sound guy. He was filming me inside. Mm -hmm. Well, he grabs the camera, starts filming the building, the leaks, the water, the squeegees, and then brings the camera outside to film me from the show going from the stage where everybody was outside. And I wound up doing 45 minutes. Yeah. And I'll tell you the truth, a lot of those people stayed and came to the second show. Yeah. Because they felt like that they wanted this. And and I said to the owner, I said, Well, at least, you know, the the the, the system works. He goes, Yeah, that's what I want, Jimmy. A fire drill on my busiest night of the week. Around here, profit's a dirty word. Nick Costas, one of the great, great club owners of of, of all time, a sweetheart of a human being. Just one of the nicest guys. And I did it for Nick because a lot of those people got up, left, and they also left their fucking tabs. Right. And so they didn't pay their tabs. So we got, he took one right in the ass that night. Yeah. Some people were cool about it, but other people, you know how people are. You know. As soon as they get a chance to leave, they're out. My thing with, I was telling somebody this earlier today. I said, when you have an audience, you know, an audience consists of 250 to 450 
and it all functions as like these separate organisms, right? You know, but it also it acts as one group. Like it, it, it's 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 like two hundred. There's four hundred fifty cells that make up one organism, right? And so when someone heckles you, you have to allow them to piss off everybody sitting around them. Yeah. Because if you don't do that and you go right after them, and I've made this mistake before, the whole audience reacts like you're coming after all of them. Right. And a lot of them were having a good time. But if you let that one guy annoy everybody in his stratosphere, and after the third time, I'll give you a look, I'll go back into talk on what I'm doing, I'll say something, and the third time, I'm going to fucking come at you. Right. And I'm going to remove you like a little bit of verbal laser surgery. See, my thing now, as this is what I say, I said, I don't care if you yell at me. I got one feeling, and I fucking dare you to hurt it. That's not my concern. My concern is I have a room full of people here, and they all pay good money to come see a show. And maybe that couple sitting behind you had a baby two years ago, and they finally found a babysitter they can trust. They haven't been out of the house. I said, hey, tonight we'll go have some laugh and have some comedy. Unfortunately for them, they sat at your table. And you're just being fucking rude and ruining their evening. And that's what pisses me off. Then, then the audience feels like you're fighting for him. Right. And he's right. You know, then I just got chills when I said that because I know when you, when they go, the audience shifts. So then it's, you get them right on your side. And that is a, an imperative, you know. And you know me, bro. I, I, I got, I, I talk like I, I learned to breathe through my ears. Right. You know, I'm getting ready to release my new album. It's coming out on May 15th. And people should go get it. It's, uh, it's available for pre-order now. It's called Zero Tolerance, available on iTunes. I don't even take a fucking breath till 22 minutes in. I go, hey, anyway, it's good to be here in Burbank. <laughs> like, my opening segment is 22 minutes long. I'm, a, I'm my own worst critic. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, I listened to this album six fucking times. It is my favorite album I've ever done. The material is smart. It's funny. The audience is fucking awesome. The writing, I think, is, is at another level. And I'm just, I'm just fucking really happy. Again, you know, it's, it'll be my fourth album, and I'm really proud of it. And uh, it just so happens, uh, you know, I'm getting released in the middle of a pandemic, so I'm hoping everybody buys it. But it, it's fucking yeah. hilarious, old school fucking comedy. You know me, bro. I'm, an, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like an OG, man. Yeah, man. Uh, it's all, it's all good, man. I. Uh, Thanks for having me on, bro. Thanks. You say, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when it uh, it comes. It'll come out. Bro, uh, you better tag me on the fucking I'll social media, or I'm gonna come over there. I'm gonna come over there with a fucking Chinese hooker from fucking Wuhan province with a fucking runny nose and a fucking itchy crotch and make her fucking sneeze on you, bro. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs>